A billion people on this earth will get their light tonight from burning kerosene in a can like this. That's a billion with a B. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? These people live in countries that have to subsidize the kerosene industry, that is oil companies, with $80 billion per annum so that these, the poorest can keep the lights on, as it were. So they're deepening their dependency on fossil fuels by spending their money to pollute their indoor air and exacerbate climate disruption with this sucky service. This is light for a billion people. The irony for me is even worse in that kerosene is what we use to replace whale oil. That's right, 200 years ago, it was whale oil that we had for light at night. In fact, Sydney Cove back here was largely developed as a whaling station because the world wanted whale oil for street lamps. They had to move it over to Mossman when the boiling of blubber got too much for the penal colony. It's funny how things change, that you shift dirty industries to Mossman, huh? <laughs> now, the, the reason I'm giving you this history is that I'm passionate about clean energy but the real clean energy, the stuff that falls from the sky, solar power. And I like to think that we can do this. We can take heart that humanity's shifted from this dirty energy to this slightly cleaner stuff, the kerosene, in the past. This time, we're going to do it for real. We're going to make the break to a truly clean energy system, which is going to make a step change, not just in how we produce power, but the power relations of our society themselves. We can create abundance by abandoning fossil fuels and turning on the sun. <laughs> I'm here tonight because I'm sort of an avid reader of social change books and, and I love thinking about how it happens. I'm also this Greenpeace guy that kind of made good by starting a global solar company. But I'm not going to tell you so much about the what as the how. I want to talk to you about what I've learned about how to make change through a journey that started about 20 years ago for me, going up to PNG to document abuses by oil companies going into the new hydrocarbon province of the Southern Highlands. Now, I ended up teaming up with people that wanted to blockade and stop the projects, but others in their community wanted them. They fell for the promises of development, or devil upment, as one of the local leaders called it. And the projects went ahead. Chevron poured a billion dollars in, they pulled a billion barrels of oil out and made billions of dollars of profit. But the people are still poor. In fact, these kids in the photo, now grown men, are probably going to burn kerosene in their homes tonight because the dream of electrification didn't happen. Exxon's up there now with the same promises, talking about taking the gas out of them, their hills, to sell to the world for electricity, but it won't come back to the community. Rather, they'll be deepening their dependence on this sort of stuff, and the resource curse will play out in PNG ongoing. But you kind of know that story, right? The bit I want to tell you is the, the learning I had almost as an afterthought, which is that in this village, there was an aid post with a solar panel back in 1993 running a vaccine fridge. And even though solar wasn't able to be deployed at scale at that time there or here, it gave me this inkling, a, a glimmer of hope and light on the horizon. So I came back to Australia and I took up causes to resist fossil fuels in other ways. We wanted to reduce demand, so we teamed up with public transit enthusiasts and others to stop motorways. Now, since some of you probably drove down the M2, you know that this campaign to protect Macquarie's ecological reserve didn't work, right? <laughs> but what I learned from that, aside from how to use a megaphone, you don't put your mouth too close, is, uh, you know, this is before Twitter and Facebook, to get your message out, you have to tell a message that people want to hear. Not just the, the bad, the problem, the car dependence, but the solution, the public transport that's easy and real. You've got to keep it simple and help them see how they can do that in their lives. So I went on and I campaigned for about a decade with communities living with oil and mining operations and resisting them around the world. Now, this is where I learned about real struggle with real heroes for me as someone from privilege like Sydney, Australia. Ken Sarawiwa, for example, who, you know, this is a life and death matter, the Nigerian leader who kicked Shell out with nonviolence and was killed for his troubles. I had another mate murdered in Colombia fighting oil for the Uwa people. And then last decade, a guy that pretty much led the community to stop a coal plant at Bonok in Thailand murdered for his efforts. So I've learned the hard way, the meaning of struggle. And courage is contagious, like we heard from Jen and Benny Wender this morning. Courage gave me cause to go to Houston 
to the heart of the oil industry one day and hang this silly banner which said, Houston, we have a problem. Stop oil exploration. And it had the desired effect. Disrupted an oil conference of energy executives and ministers making deals, and it got a lot of PR. But it taught me about the power of these businesses, because I spent the next three days sitting in jail. <laughs> it was a pretty heady experience, but it turns out that the crane was owned by Kellogg, Brown and Root, then owned by, or run by Dick Cheney. And they had the book thrown at us. We were actually up on bail that was 10 times the average bond for a murderer in Houston. So if you want an object lesson in the power of your opponents, spend some time in general population prison in Texas. You don't want to mess with these people. After that, I kind of saw the world through brown-colored glasses, I guess. Everything was about how entrenched the mentality of fossil fuels was. And I came back to Australia and maybe had the most hilarious example of that in my life with this action, which was just up the street near Martin Place. We were trying to block blockade the then prime minister into his office, his electoral office. But the funny bit was that the bloke who came out to berate us wasn't John Howard, it was Wayne Swan, the ALP then opposition treasurer. And he came out and had a, had a good go, and I, I realised in a flash that, you know, despite their complete distrust of each other, Australia's major political parties have coal in their blood so much that they'd put that ahead of everything else. I mean, he was yelling at us, telling us that this was crazy. I know that the coalition has coal in the name, but the ALP seems to have it in their heart. <laughs> Wayne's, Wayne's point was that there was no alternative to sh digging it up and shipping it offshore. And the learning there was this Tina syndrome. There is no alternative. That's how they think about the world, that we don't have options. But I learned another way that we do. There are alternatives. And the way I learned that was with a campaign in California where we ran a ballot initiative to issue $100 million worth of bonds to get solar and wind projects financed in the city of San Francisco. And we won this plebiscite by 73% of the vote. Now, I'd been doing electoral politics since 1983 in the Franklin Dam, and I'd never seen anything get three quarters of the population to vote for it. So it was like, aha, that's so amazing that we could get that. People love this solar stuff. And that really is the key learning that I've had over time. You know, there's a lot there that I've talked about, power and politics and economics and marketing and propaganda, but the key I want you to know is the power of an answer, the power of yes. We need to say no and stop bad things happening. We need to challenge injustice and throw our bodies in the gears of the machine and organize people power to stop the outrages of carbon production. But we've also got to get better at giving a growing voice to yes, to tell the solutions, to be the change. If we can say the yes, share the how, then people will start to see that there's opportunity in change, that it can serve their self-interest. I've become pretty open to the fact that the profit motive is a great driver for change, rather than just being an obstacle. Business is one of the tools by which this social movement will succeed. Movements and markets are part of the paradigm shift. We will have problems with capitalism, we'll have solutions with it too. That's why I started Sungevity with a couple of mates, to spread solar to the masses and build the world's most energized network of people who power their lives with sunshine. Now, academic theorists talk about social change in terms of stages. There's sort of the period where the rebel needs to say the no, and then the reformer or the entrepreneur needs to say the yes. What I'm saying to you is that we need to embrace that theory of change more with the climate and energy discourse. We need to be the ones showing that there is answers and a yes to be had in this climate discourse, and that people will benefit from it if we reject the scarcity mentality. That's their narrative. Scarcity pits us against one another to the advantage of the powers that be, if you'll excuse the pun. Abundance is our narrative. Their propaganda machine makes us forget that we have a resource that produces more energy that we can now tap profitably in a month than all the coal, oil, and gas underground. The good news is that some businesses are cottoning onto this and starting to come to our way of thinking. Now, as a businessman, I have the weird experience of reading earnings reports of companies like NRG, a giant utility in the States that runs nuclear, gas, and coal plants. This company made great pains this last quarter to tell the analysts on Wall Street with this slide behind me that they're doubling 
up their investment in solar parks because they're trying to show that they're making much better profit there than their conventional power plants. If you look at the EBITDA numbers, they're going to make twice as much profit on solar parks than their conventional coal, nukes, and gas power. And that's really bloody exciting, the profit motive at work. I used to be afraid of it, but now it gives me great optimism. The, the way here to TED, I stopped in Los Angeles to actually go to a Fortune magazine conference and brainstorm with David Crane, the CEO of this utility, and a bunch of other executives on ways for America to get 50 million homes to go solar by 2018. And it was the most energized conversation I've had with a bunch of capitalists ever. It was fantastic. <laughs> it's kind of weird. The capitalists are coming for your rooftops, but that's a good thing. That gives me optimism. <laughs> because it means the solution will come. And coming home to Australia, I was even more enjo joyful because you guys are leading the world in this rooftop revolution. You might not even know this, but there's now a million solar roofs on Australian homes. A million. When I left Greenpeace in 2006, there were 900, 900 total systems installed that year. In 2012, there were 300,000 installed in Australia. You're saving yourself a billion dollars in energy costs going forward, and you're showing the world that it can be done. You've deployed more solar than any other country by the numbers and created the lowest costs, even while our politicians and pretenders are arguing whether this stuff even works. You're doing it. Deploying more solar makes more solar get deployed more quickly. You're showing that creating abundance makes for more abundance. And that's the idea that I want to leave with you, that we can create our own prosperity. With more solar rising to the rooftops of the world, we now see climate and energy discourse in a different light. There is an alternative. We can reject scarcity, adopt abundance, and realize that the challenge of climate disruption is one about not the end of the world, but the condition of the world without end. And we can decide to leave fossil fuels to rest in peace and kiss them goodbye like we did whale blubber. I'm Danny Kennedy. I'm an activist and an entrepreneur. Shine on. <laughs>